Attention Northwest Arkansas businesses and talent seekers. Introducing Onboard NWA.com, your hyperlocal job board crafted for our unique community. Struggling to find the perfect match for your job openings? Onboard NWA simplifies the hiring process, connecting you with the region's top talent through tailored talent matching solutions. Whether you're an employer seeking expertise or a professional looking for your next opportunity, Onboard NWA is here for you. Discover more at onboardnwa.com and let's build the future of Northwest Arkansas together. It's time for another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas, the podcast covering the intersection of business, culture, entrepreneurship, and life in general here in the Ozarks. Whether you are considering a move to this area or trying to learn more about the place you call home, we've got something special for you. Here's our host, Randy Wilburn. Hey folks, and welcome to another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and I am here today in downtown Rogers. It's one of the few times that I have been able to get out of my uh, garage, if you will, my pseudo sound room to get in front of somebody and actually do a interview. And I'm excited today to do this socially distant interview with Mr. Brian Bonk. Brian is the president and CEO of Pelfreeze. And for those of you that don't know about Pelfreeze, That's why I'm doing this podcast today. It is an amazing company that's been around for over a century, and they've been right here in downtown Rogers, and they're like the best kept secret. And we're going to change that today on this episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. So without further ado, Brian, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for coming by. Uh, Good. This company has a fascinating history and story, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to share it. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you taking me on a quick tour today. We, as I look down as, and I'm looking through a window in one of your conference rooms here next to adjacent to your office. And, you know, I, I didn't realize how much space that you guys have here in downtown Rogers. It's almost like a whole city block, if you will, or maybe even two with a processing plant. You've got storage, you've got a shipping building. I mean, you've got a little bit of everything. And and the labs. And the labs, right. A lot Can't, of labs. A lot of labs. Can't forget that. But I would love for you, as we do on every episode of the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast, is we always like to get into the individuals. So I'd love for you to tell us your curated superhero origin story mm-hmm. about Brian and how you got here, right here where we are today. And then we'll get a little into pelfries and rabbits. <laughs> sure. <laughs> So I come from a life sciences background. I did my PhD in biological engineering at MIT in Boston. So I spent about seven years doing that. I was always interested in doing something entrepreneurial. Did a couple different internships and a brief stint with a startup me and my friends were looking to launch. Toward the end of grad school, where we were, we were dead set actually on doing a startup. We spent about a year we had a technology we were looking to commercialize at the end of my PhD. We spent about a year talking to potential investors and customers and the market. And we kind of reached this point where you know, it was a good idea, but it wasn't so good that we wanted to drop everything and do it full time. So towards the end of grad school, I was looking for something to do. I wanted to do something entrepreneurial you know, in the life sciences. That was my background. I kind of stumbled upon this article. Somebody sent me, and it was about some recent MBA student who you know, like move, I think he was from Harvard and he moved to Atlanta and bought this like HVAC company and and was extremely successful at it. And it got me into this idea of, you know, what's sometimes called entrepreneurship through acquisition. And it opened me up to this whole world where, you know, this has become a fairly, a fairly popular niche career path for MBA students. But the idea is that there's, you know, thousands of baby boomer owned businesses where, where the owner is looking to retire. But the business, you know, might be too small or too weird for you know for them to sell it to a private equity firm or a larger corporation, and maybe their kids don't want to take it over. So there's kind of this unmet need for you know business owners in in this category to find a way to retire 
you know, and so this is where, you know, a young whippersnapper like me comes in or, or some MBA student comes in where they'll, you know, raise money from investors and, you know, acquire some of these businesses. And, you know, the idea is that they're, you know, stable, you know, enduringly profitable businesses that, you know, a recent MBA can run fairly, you know, with without too much management experience. So I started, you know, talking to all these people who were doing this and, and you know, the typical MBA student who does this, you know, acquires a super boring, the boring is a relative term, but, you know, to the average person, they just sound like very boring, stable businesses. You know, some MBA students I know who did this, you know, they one acquired a, a fire hose testing company in, in New Jersey. And you, you don't think about it, but all these fire apart departments, you know, need their fire hoses tested for insurance liability. You know, another person I know acquired like a, a high rise window washing business in Dallas, which again, you don't think about it, but it's like this super profitable business. And, the, you know, the owners wanted to retire. So they sold it to this entrepreneur. So as I started talking, and most people don't even realize this is a career path. You know, when you think about buying a business, you think you need to be independently wealthy. But there's sort of a whole community of investors out here who support this kind of thing. And the more I kind of, I just got really interested in this idea, and in particular because you know there are thousands of small life science companies out there. They just sell some weird reagent or. It'd just be a very niche product like Pelfries. And, you know, the investment thesis was, you know, the typical MBA student who's going out and acquiring, you know, an HVAC business, you know, doesn't have the domain expertise to run, you know, a life science reagent company like Pelfries. So nobody was doing this investment model in the life sciences. Mm -hmm. So I got super interested in this. I ended up meeting some investors. They actually teach a course about this at Harvard Business School. My the professors of this class wrote a book about it and they later became my investors. But, you know, I just got super interested in this idea of like, there's so many small and like, you know, everybody in Cambridge, you know, where I was, like they were all going into venture capital or doing like, hey, let's apply machine learning to X. Everyone was you know, raising money for their startups. But like, I want to do something totally different. And, you know, I just, I felt like there's this opportunity out there, these small businesses that, you know, you can kind of be a big fish in a small pond and, none, you know, none of the, None of these smart people in Cambridge were doing this. So I'm like, this, we have to go find one of these businesses. So I took a class at Harvard uh, from that they teach a class about this model. And that's how I got to know the people who, you know, they're professors at Harvard, but they're also quite successful. What was the title of the class? It was called Financial Management of Small Firms and then Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition. And, you know, this is actually one of the most popular classes at Harvard Business School. And, uh, you know, at MIT, you can cross-register between the yeah. schools, but it was... I like to keep all the smart kids together, right? <laughs> <laughs> But be, being one of the most popular classes, it was full. And well, well, I have to do this. I have to meet these investors. I, I'm like, we need to do this. So I sent them an email and I'm like, listen, nobody from MIT biological engineering is doing this. There's this huge opportunity. Just like, let me take your class. There's, I want to do this. And, you know, the first, you know, originally where the registrar said, you know, this class is full. You know, about a day later, the registrar emails me. He's like, "We found a place for you in this class." <laughs> so clearly, you know, they saw the opportunity too, especially given that they also occasionally back some of their students. It's an additional case study for them. It, well, it, we literally are a case study now. Yeah, this yeah. we'll talk about this journey, but you know, this journey acquiring Pelfrey is yet actually being developed into a case study that's that's going to be taught to the Harvard MBA students in the fall semester. So I'm pretty excited about that. I can talk more about that. But anyways, that, that's kind of how I stumbled into this career path and, you know, got to know my professors slash investors through this course. You know, after I graduated, finished my PhD, we negotiated some terms, but then we kind of formed a partnership, went off to the races. So, you know, the deal was, you know, they would pay me a, a modest salary and provide, you know, all the sourcing and diligence and legal expenses while I traveled around the country looking for a niche biomedical business we could acquire. So I went everywhere. I remember from California to Florida to Delaware to Utah and, and Arkansas. And you know, they go, we were very picky about our investment criteria. And you know, we wanted something that was, you know, there is large on tap market, you know, maybe underinvested in, high barriers to entry, so an enduringly profitable business. So, you know, after after about a year of traveling around and, and doing, you know, and interviewing different owners, you know, I eventually settled on, you know, we kind of set our sights on Pelfries and a lot, a lot of spooky coincidences happened. Like the, 
you know, I would send letters to these business owners and I would go, oh, hi, I'm, you know, come from a life sciences background, PhD from IT. Like, how do you feel about selling your business? You know, I have investors and, you know, I would send these letters to all sorts of business owners and business owners get these things all the time. But, mm-hmm. you know, you know, the previous owner of Pelfrey is, you know, his, the only reason he even read my letter was because his manager, Gina, who was reading his mail for him, happened to have the same maiden name as my weird Polish last name, right. Bonk. So the, the only reason he even <laughs> opened my letter was because of this weird Bonk connection. Wow. But um, we just, we have, the, you know, we have the same undergraduate degree. We just really hit it off. And uh, it ended up being about a, a year long negotiation and diligence process as we learned about the business. I believe that was quite a roller coaster, probably for both of us. But yeah, on March 31st, well, in January, I moved down here from Boston. Yeah, left. Something we have in common. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I moved down after 10 years in Boston. I, I drove down here. Me and my dog got an apartment in Fayetteville while we sort of did the remaining work uh, on, the, on closing the deal. On March 31st, we closed on Pelfries. And just in time for two species of pandemics, uh, the <laughs> COVID, and then there's also a rabbit pandemic spreading throughout the Southwest. So it was, we really got thrown into the fire pretty quickly, but it, it's been an, um, I mean, it's been an absolutely amazing adventure so far. I'm, I'm thrilled to be in Northwest Arkansas. I think this is one of the most underrated parts of the country. And it's so cool to, well, it's, there's just, when your finance professors write you a big check, that's cool. It's just, it's so cool to be here and be leading this awesome under the radar company. And just, and there's just so much potential here that we're all really excited about. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, you obviously, you spent your time and effort and you traveled, you travailed as you traveled around the country trying to identify different places. What was it specifically about Northwest Arkansas that really kind of sold you on the overarching idea of what you were trying to do that you could possibly do it here? Was it just the way that this business was run or was it kind of the overall aesthetic of this area? I mean, let's be real. I came here to acquire this business, but, you know, obviously, kind of here pretty long term. So, you know, the geography of the area is very important. And, you know, if, if I hated it here, you know, that would have factored into, you know, our decision to do this. But, uh, you know, I, and to be fair, you know, you don't really hear about Arkansas a lot in Boston. Like we vaguely know Walmart is here, but, you know, even in Boston, like we, we don't have Walmarts. I legit, until I moved here, I thought, I mean, we have Amazon and Amazon is everywhere. And, and I, I just assumed because I never heard about Walmart in Boston. I just assumed Walmart was going out of business, just being pushed out by <laughs> Amazon. And then I get down here. No, no, we are not going out of business. Right, and, right. And then met friends here who, you know, tell me about their bonuses and stuff. So it just, you know, we just don't hear a lot about Arkansas. But so, but and that, that's probably why this is such, I think, underrated part of the country. I mean, there's a, there's a stereotype. And when I first moved down here, my friends would be like, hey, you know, how many squirrels have you eaten? And, you know, and at first I was like, no, nah, they don't eat squirrels here. But then I learned about the Bentonville uh, squirrel right. barbecue oh, fest. Yeah. And then, they do eat squirrels here. <laughs> but actually, apparently it's quite good. And now I'm disappointed that, that that's canceled. <laughs> and then now we're eventually hoping to do a, a competing rabbit barbecue festival. Probably not this year, but that, that's one of the things we have planned. But it's just, I think this is the, there's, you know, this area is growing so fast that there's palpable excitement in the air. And I think, I mean, it's definitely not Boston, but you know, people are friendly. It's absolutely the, it's absolutely beautiful here, and it's just, it's really cool to be part of this Northwest Arkansas growth trajectory. Yeah, I think it is. I think maybe one of the other things that you'll probably find, and you, you I think you've already found it just based on our short conversation that we've had since I've been with you this morning, is that that people are pretty open here, and they will connect with you, and it's not about, you know, it's not about you trying to do something or everybody having an angle on something. People just genuinely want to help other people. It's just like the same way we connected. You know, yeah. we got introduced by Karen Wagaman from the Rogers Lowell Chamber of Commerce, yeah. and Karen is the ultimate connector. Yeah, absolutely. And so when she said, hey, you need to meet this person, I took it seriously because I'm like, yeah. okay, I know Karen. I, I mean, I've actually just interviewed somebody else she introduced me to yesterday. So I mean, that's just kind of the way that it is. And well, actually two days ago. But anyway, the bottom line is people here like legitimately look for ways to help each other. Yeah. And I think you're going to find that as you get here. And I've been here a couple, I've got a couple of years on you, but I came from the same place and I was the same yeah. way. And I've said it over and over when people told, when I told people I was going to Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas, they were like, why in the hell <laughs> would you go there? And I'm yeah. like, I said, listen, you know, now I tell people don't knock it until you've tried it, come right. see it. Come see what the people are all about. It, it is an amazing place. And so that's really exciting. And I think you probably won't have a hard time, 
you know, attracting some other really bright people to come here to help you grow this business. But I would love for you just to tell the audience a little bit about Pell Freeze. And, you know, again, it's it's a company that's over 100 years old, which you don't always find. And you said a couple of things that really stood out to me, which was that, you know, when you think about small business owners, typically most small businesses typically end up just closing up, right? There is no transition. There is no ownership transition of, of any kind. There isn't a plan in place. And it's hard to get people to buy something that's unknown. But you you did your due diligence. You found a company that's working. But what was it about the Pell Freeze brand that really attracted you to, you know, you said, hey, you know, we could do something with the rabbits because there's, it's almost like you have two businesses here. So I'd love for you just to kind of expand upon that and ex- and educate people on what Pell Freeze is all about. Yeah, we're a super unusual and interesting business with a fascinating history. So I'm always happy to tell this story. But yeah, the country, the company started in, in 1911 as a backyard rabbit farm in California, according to company lore. The you know, Herman Pelfrey, the, the founder of the company, gave a, a pregnant rabbit. He didn't realize it was pregnant to his son. Apparently, the rabbit's name was Betsy Ann. So he gave a pregnant rabbit to his son. According to company lore, you know, soon the Pelfrey home was overrun with rabbits as they <laughs> breed like rabbits. And again, according to the official company bio, you know, Perman uh, turned the dilemma of all these rabbits in his backyard into an opportunity and began selling rabbit meat to his neighbors. So fast forward a couple decades. Within a couple decades, the HF Pelfrey and Sons, that's Pelfrey with a PH before they changed the name. It was the largest rabbit meat company in the United States. Rabbit meat kind of peaked in popularity in World War II because it wasn't rationed like beef and chicken were. And so, you know, around that time, you know, 1940s, this rabbit meat is peaking. They they actually moved their operations to uh, Arkansas from California to take advantage of cheaper land here. And I think there was a family connection. So they moved to Arkansas. They changed their name from Pell Free with a PH to, you know, I guess frozen foods were sort of the keto of their day. I guess it was the hot new trend back in the 40s. So they, they changed their name to Pell Freeze with an FR, you know, to capture this growing wave of fro- frozen foods at the time. So they moved to Arkansas, changed their name to Pell Freeze. And about this time, you know, they're, they're the largest rabbit meat company in the United States. And about this time, you know, there's a couple breakthroughs in the 40s and 50s that really set the stage for, for the growth of the, you know, the biomedical industry today. So, you know, at the time in the 50s, you know, biomedical research is taking off, but there were no sort of catalog life science companies where you could just go buy your reagents or certainly not the way they are today. So, you know, researchers who would need like a rabbit spleen to do some tissue extraction, you know, for their experiment that they didn't already get them. So they went straight to the source and contacted the rabbit meat company. And I, I was showing Randy some of our, you know, original biological, you know, marketing materials. You know, we have these little pamphlets. You could get, you know, rabbit spleens for 15 cents, a rabbit testicle for a quarter, and a, <laughs> a gallon of rabbit urine for 15 bucks. It's who knew, interesting. Who, see- who knew a testicle was so cheap? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the rabbit testicles are not very big. But, you know, so this kind of one-off biological business, you know, originally it was a meat company where the bioproducts were the byproducts you know, quickly became, you know, a biological business where the meat was the byproduct. And so this biological business grew and, and there was a couple of sort of big successes early on. You know, one of our first successful biological products was we, there's, again, not to get too graphic, but there's a reagent used in, in blood coagulation time assays that is still a major product for Pelfries, but it's actually uses, it's derived from rabbit brains and it's used for measuring coagulation time for testing the efficacy of things like blood thinners. Yeah. Real quickly, yeah. when you say reagent, just to yeah. give people like a real layman's sure. term understanding of what a reagent is. Uh-huh. So could you do that? I mean, yeah, sure. Like a, a reagent is just like a chemical you use in an experiment. Okay. And so okay. a, anyway, in, in a biological lab, you, you know, you'll, you'll just see shelves of these things. There's just going to be bottles of all, all sorts of stuff. And, you know, Everything from salts, you know, to chemicals to media. So reagents are just are just sort of the the supplies you need to do your your experiments. Right. So it's not necessarily maybe you're developing a drug or a medical device. You know, those aren't the rea- you you need reagents to do the experiments to develop these things. Mm-hmm. So you know, back to the story. You know, not to get too much into the science, but you know, we had a couple of successful products that really grew. 
you know, the, the previous, the most recent previous owner, David, you know, he came from a chemical engineering background, a Stanford MBA, and in the 70s, bought control of the business from his family. And, you know, given his background, you know, he really brilliantly, you know, leveraged this, you know, this rabbit biological business and really built it into a, a sophisticated uh, biomedical supplier. So today we, we still have two divisions. We have our food division and our biological division, which is, you know, significantly, uh, you know, accounts for, you know, overwhelming majority of our, our, our profits. But, you know, fast forward a couple decades and we are a supplier to pretty much every major vaccine, pharmaceutical, diagnostic company. You know, if you can think of a large pharmaceutical company, you know, they're probably one of our customers or have been. So, you know, we have a database of about 9,000 customers and, you know, uh, about most of our revenue comes from about 20 to 30 big, big pharma and diagnostic companies. And, uh, you know, we serve hundreds of smaller life science companies and, and academic ex- institutions. I think at last time I looked, we were sold to older, over 40 company countries, you know, 65 employees today. So we've really found a niche as we supply critical reagents to a number of uh, to, to a number of vaccine programs and other biological applications. And just just to give an example, you know, literally the world's large top selling vaccine of all time. You know, I'm not going to say what it is, but you know, it requires this stuff called rabbit complement. They need it to test the efficacy of each lot they make, and that's. It's derived from rabbits, so so literally the world's largest, you know, top selling vaccine requires this this random reagent, you know, this this you know small company in Northwest <laughs> Arkansas, and it's and it's funny coming from Boston, you you don't I think it's really interesting to see the whole kind of supply chain, you know, in Cambridge where every you know major pharma and biotech you know is doing research in these shiny glass towers and they're brand new, you know, most people don't realize, and that's kind of what I liked about this business, this this space is. You know, people don't realize that, you know, these vaccines and stuff, you know, they rely on a supply chain that, you know, traces back to an an Amish, you know, rabbit farm in Missouri. And it's just so interesting to see, you know, we're kind of at the very bottom of this supply chain for the biotech industry. But it's just so interesting to see how we're, we're, you know, kind of a fundamental supplier of of critical reagents for these, you know, wildly successful companies. And I I kind of think of ourselves as a... uh, Kind of, kind of a picks and shovels business of the biotech industry, you know, to, you know, to use the Levi Strauss analogy, you know, these biotech and pharma companies developing drugs, they're kind of the, the gold miners, but, you know, Levi Strauss came in and, you know, he sold the, the blue jeans and picks and shovels to them and, you know, ended up making way more money than all the gold miners. But, yeah. you know, that, that's kind of our niche is, you know, we sell, you know, the necessary reagents, you know, to these larger pharmaceutical and biotech companies. I love that. I love that analogy. That, yeah. that is really good. With the with the whole Levi Strauss story, so obviously I, I got to ask you this because you know there is a vac- a race for a vaccine right yeah. now, and I would have to imagine that in yeah. some way, shape, or form, rabbits have to be involved yeah. in this process. So, in you know, I'm speaking of Operation Warp Speed, and it's I don't I don't yeah. you know I think you know obviously they, we need that we all need that. I mean, the yeah. world needs this vaccine at some point in time as quickly as we can get it, and yeah. and uh, you know they're they're breaking all kinds of records and time and space in order to try to bring something to market that will start to allay the concerns and fears that so many people have over the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, you know, vaccines work in different ways. Our sort of niche, you know, our niche is actually more in the bacterial vaccines, which is the stuff that really requires our reagents is, is certain types of bacteria. And that, that's a big market. But, you know, we are we're not really directly um, involved, although we are actually making a sale. We, we have some things that we're, and we actually are in the process of developing some, some COVID-related products. But you know, none of our none of our major customers are are, are doing COVID vaccines right now, unfortunately. But, but the, 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 there is an opportunity in that space that our R and D team is working on. Although we, we did sort of, you know, when COVID happened, we kind of found ourselves in a unique position because you know, we have these two divisions which rely on one raw material stream, and you know, we are over, overwhelmingly the largest processor of rabbits in the United States. And you know, historically, we sold them to restaurant distributors. And, and uh, you know, when COVID happened, you know, our, our restaurant sales dropped off a cliff. But you know, a lot of people were using our, our rabbit serum and products in developing COVID diagnostics. 
So, you know, on one hand, we had this on the for the bio business, you know, we couldn't get enough rabbits. You know, we were, you know, everyone, we, you know, we're still really backlogged in our rabbit serum, which is it's used as a control um, in, in uh, certain COVID diagnostic tests. And uh, so, you know, one side of the business, we, we couldn't get enough rabbits. And the other side, we had way too many. So it's kind of been this interesting uh, ba- balancing supply and demand here. It's definitely been one of the, the key management challenges since taking over. But there is, uh, we are we are working on developing some. You know, I mean, our our space is more you know, reagents and sort of standards and controls. So kind of the and we are you know working on developing control standard that we think can be used for um, certain types of COVID diagnostic tests. But um, yeah, I like that. I think I want to switch gears a little bit just because nobody listening to this podcast can in, eat, eat a reagent. <laughs> but they can't eat a rabbit. And That's the fun I saw the thing that really, really blew me away was when I saw some posts. And I want to say it was either Yayo's or another company, the local local restaurant here that had done a barbacoa uh, with the rabbit. And it looked amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, just absolutely amazing. And I know that, you know, you're you're teaming up or, or will eventually be teaming up with a number of local restaurants here to to per, to, to get rabbit on the menu and and. But I'd love to let's talk about the rabbit from a meat perspective Absolutely. for people that have never had rabbit. What yeah. does rabbit taste like? It's, it's, it's sort of rabbits are fed alfalfa. It, it kind of tastes like chicken. But because rabbits are fed alfalfa and, uh, you know, chickens are not, you know, rabbit has it has a, a slightly unique. It has a unique flavor. It, um, it tastes a little sweeter, in my opinion. Some people say gamey, but I, I don't I, I don't know if that that's the right. It's a different variation on chicken. It, it, you can. You can tell it's not chicken, but it's kind of got a chicken consistency, and um, it's an extremely lean protein, so it goes really well with things like braises and, and confits and, and stews and those sort of things. And so a lot of chefs love cooking with rabbit because it's just, it has a very unique flavor profile, and, and you can do you know, some, some, really, uh, some really nice things with it. I mean, the problem with rabbit meat is, you know, mo- it's, you know Europe, it's way more popular but you know, unless you went to culinary school or like grew up hunting, you've probably never had rabbit. You know, or you're you're one of the you know come from one of the few ethnic groups where in the U.S. where you know rabbit is a big part of their cuisine. It's just a lot of people don't know what to do with it, and you know that that was you know this is this is you know part of our you know we have sort of two very different divisions. We have the biological division and the food division, and I think both of them are are untapped opportunities in their own right because. You know, I think rabbit will always be sort of a specialty item. You know, it's kind of like hamburger over over in Europe. But you know, I, I don't think we'll ever get there. But there's just this barrier. People people don't know what to do with it. People, and to be honest, they they don't know how to get it either. It's not sold in a lot of stores. It's not sold in any major retailer in any volume. So you know, as part of our marketing efforts uh, with the food division, you know, we wanted to. Get people. So we we launched a, and and well, this all started when um there's a brewery next door to Pelfries and they have this food truck, three cents an acre. So so this all started when I just uh you know I you know, there's a beer company next to the food company. We we should do something. Mm-hmm. So I called the food truck and um you know like we should just do a special thing like to celebrate new ownership. They were a New Orleans themed food truck, three cents an acre. And, uh, you know, we, we should do something. The rabbit's really big in Cajun culture. So, you know, we got talking and, and it turns out Meredith, who owns the food truck, she, uh, you know, she also does sort of food marketing and just marketing for local restaurants and apparently knows like every, every chef in Northwest Arkansas. So we got talking. She started helping us with our social media and just, you know, posting, you know, originally it was just going to be like, hey, let's just post some rabbit recipes. Let's take some nice, delicious looking photos and kind of Maybe we can make this go viral. You know, maybe we can get with the right, you know, buy-in from chefs. You know, maybe we can just generate more interest, lower the barrier to to eating rabbit. You know, which can be a very intimidating protein. It's um, it's just people don't know what to do with it. So you know, after brainstorming, and, and you know, Meredith is great at, at social media. You know, well, we should do a pop up, and that's what that's Meredith's thing. She she does pop ups um, among many other her many other talents. So you know, our first food event was kind of experimental. They um. Three cents an acre. They made a, a rabbit gumbo, and it was, we did it in the Ozark. Uh, Ozark, you know, in collaboration with Ozark, which is right next door to us. 
wildly successful, you know, sold out. It was this, it was absolutely delicious. We got, we got tons of compliments. And so we should be doing these events more often. Um, and, and, you know, Meredith knows, knows all these chefs. So, you know, we, uh, the next one we partnered with Yeo's, which is a Mexican restaurant down the street. Really good. They, they made a rabbit barbacoa a taco. Um, and so we, we have a bunch of these events lined up. We're try- hoping to do one of these every couple months just to, to lower the barrier to rabbit. And, uh, in, in, also, we're we're in the process of you know a lot of our marketing materials you know for such an old company are, are a little bit outdated and we have these kind of old retro recipe books we've been giving out but you know th- there's an opportunity to update these so what what we kind of envisioned was you know let's partner with local chefs rabbit is you know very popular in relative to the rest of the country very popular in this region so l- let's let's partner with local chefs and we'll, let's get a, ra- a rabbit recipe from each of them. We'll, you know, we'll include it in our, our promotional recipe book and it can be an opportunity to, you know, cross promote our products so we can, you know, promote these local restaurants that are featuring our product and, you know, promote pelfries, promote rabbits. So we're, we're, we're putting in the final stages of putting this together. Uh, hopefully I'll have it launched in, in about a month. But yeah, as part of these generating these recipes, interacting with local chefs, uh, you know, we we have some ex- exciting events planned. There's, you know, uh, uh, after the rabbit gumbo and rabbit tacos, we have a rabbit pizza planned. Uh, we, uh, I think, our next one, hoping to get one of the barbecue places to uh, to do like a, a rabbit sausage. We're probably going to cook it out of our little storefront that we just launched. So uh, yeah, a lot of really good recipes. Uh, and and Mer- Meredith has been running all this, but uh, she's uh, I kind of lost track of all the projects she's doing. But uh, it's uh, we have a lot of the local chefs lined up to partner with us. Yeah, and I, and I love that, and I'm hoping maybe maybe you can connect with Jordan Wright from Wright's Barbecue or somebody yeah. like that. If I mean, you're listening to yeah, this, we so would we would love to do a special. And, and Jordan has been on the podcast, uh, as has uh, Matt Cooper from yeah. The Preacher's Son, uh, as has um, Jason Paul from Heirloom, mm-hmm. which is not open right now, mm-hmm. but he is an amazing chef. So there are some really good folks. I'm also looking at your. You have a list. They have a store. So if you guys ever come down here on North Arkansas. The address is 205 North Arkansas. Is that correct? They, the storefront is actually 219 North 219 Arkansas. North Arkansas. Yeah. But yeah, if you if you just go right past the Pell Freeze sign, you can look to the right there. There's a little building and um, they have Pell Freeze proteins there. They can sell whole rabbit. <laughs> yeah. I don't, what is that pre-Q rabbit? Is that? Uh, uh, it's it's just sort of pre, pre-butchered. pre Oh, I got yeah, you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hind legs, eye of loin, and there they do have liver available upon request, but if you want to get some of the Pell Freeze proteins before yeah. the market blows up and you find them in Whole Foods and O and F and all these other, you know, fabulous stores, um, you can uh, you can get them right here locally in Rogers. So well, th- this this all started, and you know, our, our storefront is pretty modest. Uh, <laughs> you know, th- this all started. You know, you know, traditional, you know, historical. We we sold kind of rabbit by the pallet to big distributors. Um, you know, within a couple of weeks of taking over the business, you know, somebody actually came in the office and. Yeah, he just wanted his his wife wanted to make a rabbit pot pie, so he was just looking for a couple rabbits. And we we didn't take credit cards. Uh, we weren't set up for this, so you know we had to like walk him down to the plant, you know, get his information, invoice him. He must have really wanted that pie because he was waiting for like twenty minutes. But you know, and people just started coming up to me after I bought the business, like, "Hey, my my grandmother used to raise rabbits for pelfries. I love rabbit, and I just don't know where to get it." And you know, getting into retailers is, is is a process, but like we we need, you know, we're selling this stuff by the pallet. We you know we need a way to make this accessible to the community. Who, uh, so we we did open this little storefront just to do you know consumer orders, uh, which has has been fun and it's been very successful. We've gotten um, more business than we expected from it, and it's it's just you know we have such a strong Pelfries, you know, being in downtown Rogers for you know seventy plus years, we we have this strong. Uh, connection with the community and and it's um you know it's important to me that that we embrace that and uh and partner as much as we can with the, the local restaurant community here so you know we've been the way we've been doing this is is providing sort of samples you know experimental samples for uh you know chefs to try out a recipe on you know we provide them for free and then you know there's a discounted uh, if they want to keep offering rabbit then we'll, we'll provide it to them at a, at a discount to our wholesale prices so but it's we're, we're such a big part of it. We, you know, an, I'll be under rate under the radar, but we're, we're such. A, we've been in downtown Rogers for so long that it, you know it's very important to us to nurture these community ties. And really, this is we learned this is kind of an opportunity to really revitalize you know a, a really hometown Arkansas brand. So that this is this has been a lot of fun. I'm very pleased with how that's going. Good, good, good. Well, like I said, I mean, I, I said it earlier, and 
And I do think that that will be the case that as as people catch on about Pelfries and about what you're doing and the new ownership and just how you're expanding things, I think what you're going to find is that you're going to get a lot of people that are going to raise their hand and say, I'm interested in either just buying rabbits or yeah. making some connections because right. I know some people that have an interest in that. Mm-hmm. So I think that's really huge. I'm actually going to make a couple of connections for you after yeah. this podcast because I think it'll be beneficial. But um, I appreciate it. But yeah, I, I'm just thankful that you, you know, that we got a chance to connect. And and I mean, this story is, I think it's, it's just, there. it's amazing on a number of levels. <laughs> First of all, it's just, it's just a great entrepreneurial story. I think it's important for people to understand. You said a couple of key things on this podcast, which I don't want anyone to miss out on is that, especially when you were taking the class, that even when you were told no, that the registrar said, hey, it's closed (laughs) up, you still reached out and somebody made a way. And I think a lot of times we give up at the first no, and you can't do that. I think you need to keep pushing forward. So that's a great example of that. And I certainly recognize that aspect of it. But then I also like the fact that you're finding a way within the business to make use of everything, right? Like literally the whole rabbit. And I think that that a lot of times we miss out on opportunities that are like right there in front of us. And I mean, granted, that's kind of the business plan for this business, but, you know, you can apply that in a lot of other spaces that we operate in where people don't really take full advantage of all of the opportunities that might be available to them. Yeah, when, when you're in the life, yeah, you know, when you're dealing with animals, it's, it's an, an in the life science space. It's, it's very important to make sure you know, as little as possible goes to waste. Yeah, um, just absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, Brian, I really appreciate this. Just in your short time here, what do you like to do in your spare time when you're not physically in this building? Because I imagine you know, you're probably here a lot. You're probably burning the midnight oil quite a bit. But when you're not physically in this building and you're not dreaming about rabbits, what, <laughs> do you, what, do you, what are you doing for fun here in Northwest Arkansas? Sure. Well, I, well the good news about not, not having a, a lot of time uh, to do uh, things is that I have there's still a pretty long list of things I want to do. I didn't know it's going to take me a couple of years, I think, to check everything off. But it's, it's just exploring the area has been, there's just so many fun bars and breweries and restaurants. I'm trying to do more hiking. I, I, I bought a Jeep. Uh, I'm always looking for you know, it's, uh, it doesn't really make sense to have a Jeep in Boston, but right, you know, I'm always right. looking for excuses to take that off road and take the doors off. Yeah. I, I play, I play a little music too. Um, I've been playing, uh, it's kind of how I want unwind at the end of the day. I've sure. been, um, I play keyboards and s- sing a little bit. So yeah. And, and I just bought a house here. So that, that's also keeping me busy just down the street in downtown Rogers. So oh, nice. between, nice, between nice. the Jeep, the house, the business, it's everything's, everything's keeping me busy. So you're making some roots here. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> there you go. this is, uh, I love that. We're, in, we're in this for the long haul. Oh, good, good. I'm glad to hear that. And, and I would imagine that maybe in the, in the near future too, that it, that might also mean some new employees that you may have to hire depending on how the business goes. And and so there'll be plenty of opportunity for growth in that area. Absolutely. We, we've definitely been investing in our, you know, R&D team. There's, we just, I didn't even get a chance to get into it, but there's, you know, we have you know, so many of these large pharmaceutical and, and, and biotech companies as customers. And there's just, there's so many product development opportunities. You know, once once you sort of build the relationship as a supplier to these companies, they start asking like, hey, hey, can you do this? <laughs> and then these, you know, these new product development opportunities come up. And that's how a lot of our, our, our successful, most successful product lines have grown. So, you know, we've been, you know, investing in both equipment, supply chain things, but also making some key hires in our R&D, actually in both divisions. But um, yeah, we, we have p- big plans for the business. Man, I love that. That's great. That's great. Well, I appreciate I appreciate you sharing your story. Would you mind giving us the name of the book that your professors wrote? Oh, sure. It's called the uh, the Harvard Business Review Guide to Buying a Small Business. Okay. Um, All right. That's simple enough. <laughs> it's uh, straight and to the point. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Purchasing a small business. All right. Perfect. Well, Brian Bonk, I really appreciate you coming on the I'm Northwest Arkansas podcast. I'm, I'm uh, delighted to be a part of it. Absolutely. We, we hope that uh, people get something out of that. Now, I, and I'm going to put you on the spot. I didn't sure. say this before, but is there anything special you'd like to offer our I Am Northwest Arkansas listeners if they want to come up here and get some rabbit? Uh, mention the podcast or Randy's name or just a fun fact you learned from the podcast. We'll, we'll hook you up with a discount. There you go. There you go. Well, there Wh- you whether it's on our rabbit or at, you know, we're doing these events. But yeah. we'll, we've, uh, we'll, we'll hook just you up with something. Absolutely. Please mention the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast and that you heard Brian here first and Maybe even a little something, a little tidbit about Pell Freeze, and we can go from there. But 
I have no illusion that these guys are going to really grow this into something big. Not that it isn't already big in the space that they're in, but I think that they're going to create some new opportunities here in Northwest Arkansas that everybody's going to be excited about. So, Brian, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much, Randy. Appreciate it. Well, there you have it, folks. Another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. I really appreciate you listening. I was just really blown away by Brian's story. I don't know about you guys, but I want to listen to this again because there were some things that he shared that really encouraged me as a small business owner. So I hope you got something out of that. As as always, we like to focus on the intersection of business, culture, entrepreneurship, and life here in the Ozarks. And it kind of cut a swath between all these different areas. And so really excited to see what Brian and his team are able to do in the future. And Definitely, as he said, come on up here. If you come up to Rogers, downtown Rogers, right around the corner from Onyx Coffee, go grab some coffee over at Onyx, come over here and get some rabbit and then take it on home and make your wife or make your husband a stew or some gumbo or something like and, that. And don't forget to pick up some beer at Ozark. Yeah. Right don't forget door. to, yeah, big shout out for Ozarks. You can get, get some beer over there as well. So definitely want to encourage you to do that. But thank you again for listening to the podcast today. Our podcast is brought to you by the exclusive real estate group down in Fayetteville, Chris Dinwiddie and his team of agents do an amazing job when it comes to real estate. So if you need real estate help, if you just have a question, check out Chris Dinwiddie and his team at the exclusive real estate group. They really know what they're doing when it comes to real estate, period. And if you want to learn a little bit more about Chris specifically, I did an episode with him several months ago that you can check out as well here on the podcast. It tells you a little bit more about his approach to real estate here in Northwest Arkansas. If you're new to the area, and you haven't purchased yet, because I always tell people when they move to a new area, they should rent first before they know before they buy, because they need to know where they want to live. And then once they buy, you should always find a good realtor so that they uh, they can help you navigate the process. And Chris Dinwiddie and his team at the Exclusive Real Estate Group can definitely help you do that. So that's all we have for you this week. Again, check out the podcast wherever great podcasts can be found. Give us a rating, give us a review, let us know what you think about the podcast. And keep listening and share it with a friend. Remember, sharing is caring. That's it. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and I will see you next week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. Check us out each and every week, available anywhere that great podcasts can be found. For show notes or more information on becoming a guest, visit IamNorthwestArkansas.com. We'll see you next week on I Am Northwest Arkansas.